Thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to talk about two of my favorite topics: APIs, and then financial and banking. Uh, I have to juggle with both of these at the same time, so pardon me. I, I, I might take the mic away and put this over here, but that's fine. Okay. So I, I wanted to quickly talk about API adoption patterns in banking, which is, uh, APIs have been around for a while. I don't want to talk too much about APIs. I think we had sessions in the morning that talked about APIs in general, what's the benefit of APIs. I wanted to go down and drill down further, specifically in the banking and financial industry, how we have been seeing large financial or large banking customers kind of adopting APIs. And then I want to talk a little bit about microservices. Uh, we are uh, a lot of a lot of us are technology enthusiastic. I'm VP of product marketing at Akana. Akana used to be known as SOA Software. Uh, we rebranded to Akana early this year. Uh, we have been we were SOA, we were API, and now we are looking into microservices. There's a lot of kind of talk about microservices. A lot of our customers, which are large banks, have started looking at microservices. So I wanted to take a little bit time. As uh, Mehdi said, he wanted, we had met at DockerCon, we, we met at other conferences, so there's a lot of talk about microservices. I wanted to talk about that as well. So quickly jumping in, I mean, uh, just a very big overview, a very high level overview. So there's di di digital disruption going on across industries, and banking is left untouched. Banking also, there's a digital disruption going on. There are a lot of factors that are kind of uh, can you see the slides? Is it, or it's too much light over there? Can you see? Okay, fine. So there are a lot of factors behind digital disruption. Uh, I've listed out a few. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I wanted to specifically talk about two things. First is mobile. So mobile and all the different channels, whether it's multi-channel or, or uh, omni-channel, that's obviously driving a lot of digital disruption. And it's not about the channel itself. When we talk about mobile being or multi-channel or omni-channel being a digital disruptor, it's not about the channel. It's about taking that service, or in this case, taking banking, taking financial services to the customer where and wherever he is or she is. The customer no longer goes to a brick and mortar chain. You don't go to an e-commerce chain or a blog. To, you go and shop at Amazon. You go to e-commerce. Similarly, banking, you're seeing customers want access to services wherever they are, at whatever time, whenever they are. And that's kind of when when i talk about multi channel i think about when i am mobile when i am outside i am in a train i am in a subway if i want to look up my banking information if i want to make a transfer if i want to make an investment can i make it right over there with whatever medium is there with me so that's very very important when we talk about multi channel there's a lot of other things cloud blockchain payments fintech the other thing is customer centricity the digital disruption that's going around it's very, very focused on the customer itself, which is traditionally, if you look at financial services and across a lot of industries, I'm not picking up financial and banking, it was about the company itself and what it offered. If it's like in financial, if it's wealth management or is it insurance products or is it retail banking or is it commercial banking, a, a lot of these organizations and banks have been structured based on how they are organized and what they are selling. It's no longer about the customer. It's like, okay, you are coming here for mortgage. I sell mortgage. Uh, if you want to open a retail bank account, go to other part of the bank. They will deal with it. That's not the case anymore. If you have the attention of the customer, sell the customer or provide the service to customer, whatever the customer wants, whatever the context of that server is, of that customer is. And that's a lot about this digital disruption. It's no longer about I as a company, as a corporation, this is what I sell and this is exactly what I sell. My partner sells this. You go, you have an opportunity to sell a customer something, you service a customer of every need that he or she has right over there. If you look at traditional banks, and I'm, I want to take the context not, not more of a fintech, I want to take the context from a large bank or a large financial agency perspective. There are a lot of challenges. There's regulation, there's security, uh, they have a lot of legacy systems like mainframes. So they, they, traditionally, they move slow, and there's a lot of organizations and their 
infighting going on in lot, uh, a lot of these organizations. So, so, so there are challenges. So there are a lot of challenges. And if you really look at what is hindering banks from going digital, and a lot of banks are going, a lot of our customers are going digital, it's not one of the things over here, it's not that they're not aware of multi-channel or mobile initiatives. It's not that they are not moving to the cloud. They're moving to the cloud slowly and surely, and not once at all. They, it's not that they don't know what's happening in blockchain or they don't know how to use blockchain or fintech or consumer preferences. I, I don't think that's the that's the challenge. There are a lot of smart people, a lot of you are probably working, working for these banks. It's not the challenge that you don't know about these things. The challenge is essentially core to all of this is speed. It is can you execute and can you provide these services? Can you provide a mobile app? Can you provide, can you uh, capitalize on blockchain? Can you do what your fintech counterparts are doing? And can you do it with the speed and agility that others are doing? And that's primarily the challenge. I was talking to a big bank uh, about a couple of years ago. And they said, yes, we want to take out a mobile app. It's not that we cannot take out a mobile app or we don't want to. But it took them almost a year, year and a half to take out a mobile app. And that was not because they didn't have the technology. It's like they had to work through various different organizations. They have to get through regulatory compliance. They had to choose the right vendor. The vendor approval took a lot of time. So there's a lot of those things that take a lot of time. It's not that they are not aware. So that's exactly where APIs come into picture. APIs are a key to competitive dynamics. Not only do they allow you to take your products and services and expose them to all the different channels that you might want to expose them, they make it happen with speed and agility. Because you can take a specific service, you can take a specific data point, and you can expose it as an API. Uh, and you can do that fairly, fairly quickly if you do it, if you, if you take the right steps. And, that, and I want to kind of concentrate on those right steps. Uh, uh, so API adopters in banking, these are some of our customers. So Akana, we have been around for 10 years. Uh, we were traditionally a SOA governance player, then API management, and now microservices. These are a bunch of our customers in banking industries. And based on how they have been adopting APIs, I want to talk about some five specific patterns or five step specific steps that you need to take in order to go and expose APIs and do so with speed and agility and security. So the first one is obviously unlock your data. A lot of banks, if you look at a lot of legacy applications, it might be legacy data sources, you might have mainframes, you might have services that are SOAP-based services or other COBOL-based services, uh, packaged apps or legacy apps that you have built in. And this all data is siloed. It's sitting inside your bank. You have to break those data silos. You have to break that data silos in the sense, make these services available available outside, whether you do it as SOAP, or you use a traditional ESB, or you have directly an API exposed to them, you need to make, you have to break these data silos and make it available as a service. And there's a lot of ways in which you can do it. There's no good, there's no right, but do it that you can do it in a way that you can do it fast. The other is when you create, when you expose data out of these different applications or data sources, think about creating customer-centric views, which is if your data, if you have wealth management app, or if you have a data source that con contains customer information that you are serving for retail banking or mortgage banking, don't just expose that data as an API. That might or might not make a sense. Think about what you want to expose as an API. It might mean that you want to take data for a specific customer. It might require data come from multiple sources or multiple application. And you have to munch that data, process that data, transform that data. So think about how to create a customer-centric view. Before you expose an API, before you expose a service, think about what service it is going to provide to a customer. And it might require you to take multiple data streams. So being able to orchestrate that data and process that data is extremely, extremely important. And then expose them as APIs. Take your data silos. And as banks, you all kind of know it. There's organizational silos, there's data silos, there's application silos. And a lot of your time goes in kind of managing those silos or breaking, exposing data from silos. So that's the first step. The second step 
is sharing APIs. And sharing APIs is like, that's the purpose of APIs. If you look at SOAP, SOAP was already exposing those services as traditional services, as SOAP-based services, not as, uh, as REST-based APIs. But one of the things that APIs has made it possible is mass consumption or mass sharing of APIs and cell service of those APIs. But a lot of banks, like one bank that I'm currently working, one of the largest banks in the US, and rightfully so, under pressure from fintech and payment services, they exposed the first API project that the bank took on was an external API for payment services, and they exposed it externally. It was a very successful launch. But the problem that the bank had was nobody inside, culturally inside the bank, apart from that one organization or one team that had launched the API externally, inside the bank, the entire like thousands and uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, developers, or not developers, the people they have, they didn't know about APIs. The question they used to get is, what is this appy thing, appy thing, like what, what are you talking about? So I think one of the most important thing when you share APIs is learn to walk before you run, which is, imbibe that culture of sharing APIs internally, which is bring about internal evangelism within your organization, within the different IT organization, within the different lines of businesses, and adopt APIs internally. Most large banks or most successful banks that have exposed APIs and they're doing it in the right way have done it because they have done it the right way. They have built a cultural culture internally about what an API is, how you can share information with APIs. And APIs foster internal innovation and efficiency. If you look at what APIs do is, you have so many different data sources, so many different organizations. If you start exposing these services and your internal applications and internal organizations start using these APIs rather than being able to, a lot of times we see uh, a lot of banks say, Oh, we were building an application, we needed a service, we went to a specific uh, IT shop and said, okay, can you build a service? Whereas that same service already existed somewhere else, somebody had already invested, but it was sitting in a silo, nobody else knew about it, so they had to invest another three months or four months to build another service using probably another protocol. So being able to imbibe that culture of exposing data streams internally and exposing them as APIs and sharing internally is very, very, very important. And there are some very, very unique characteristics of an internal API catalog. If you look at external APIs, most organizations have few external APIs. You look at Google Map APIs, it's one API. You look at a payments API, usually coming from various different vendors, there's one single API. It's not People don't have thousands of external APIs. But organizations internally can have thousands and thousands of APIs based on different data sources. So what you need is an API catalog where you can publish all these different APIs. That catalog needs to be searchable. So when people come in internally and search for, oh, do I have a service that shows all the mortgage customers or all mortgage customers that have more than a million pounds or a million dollars of mortgage, they should be able to see that service. So it should be searchable. It should be a searchable catalog. Second is what we have seen in a lot of our internal organization. It should be policy-based search or policy-based view, not even access to the API whether they are being able to own, search that API and see an API exist, a lot of times that itself is policy-based. You might not want, like, uh, not a banking example, it's an HR example, like the salary API of an employee. You don't want that API to be publicly published on your internal catalog. Not everybody needs that API. So there needs to be a policy-based view of control of who can go and search that API and who can even access that API and then get an API key. And then finally, have internal hackathons. Build that culture, like I said, of internal adoption to APIs. Only when you build that internal culture of APIs will you be successful externally. Will you have a true digital transformation that you want or desire in your organization? So, so that's the characteristics. Those are the first two steps. First, unlock your data silos. Then share those APIs. After you have done those two things, the third thing comes in, security. When you talk about banks, security is very, 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 very important. 
you guys know that more than we do. Uh, so, so you have to take into account how to secure that API. If you look at security, or if you look at API security, there's some specific things that you need to take care when you're exposing an API and sharing an API. The first one is obviously secure your backend. So secure where your application is sitting, uh, what applications there are. The second is, as you are exposing those APIs, secure the channel. Secure the communication path as that's exposing. The third and the, four, the most important things are enable easy developer access, which is when you're exposing an API, you want dev developers to obviously be able to access those APIs, test those APIs, adopt those APIs. So making it easy for developers to be able to access that APIs, but at the same time, make sure that the information is secure, which is once somebody has developed an app and they're accessing your API, how are they managing that data? Is that data itself secure? So securing the PII data, PHI data, personal, uh, and managing the user experience. The, finally, the user experience of consuming that API as a developer, and as well as the app that they're creating should be great. So we recently at Akana, we did a security survey. You can go to akana.com and download that security survey. We did a global survey around more than 1,000 people responded to it, mostly enterprises, large enterprises, Fortune 500 enterprises. Uh, some of the few things that people are concerned about from an API perspective, API security, the XML bomb, JSON schema, so invalid JSON schema, or somebody might do inject a SQL injection or some malformed data into a cross-site script. Uh, scripting, XML attacks, impersonation, so all of these different things, but you can go and find uh, much more detail if you go and download that survey report. But the most important important thing that was that came from that security survey, and it was actually a little bit surprising to us as well, was people as producers, you mostly, like your banks are producers of API, you expose those APIs. but. And, and people take all kind of security steps in, in order to ex secure that API. But once that data, like once the data leaves the API, it's with the app developer and the app that is being created. What people said was they were not taking enough steps to make sure that that data itself in the app is secured. If they're locally, locally storing it, if they're creating a local cache, if they have access to security, uh, social security number or bank or a credit card number or this, if they're taking that input from, from the customer and then sending it to the back end, what are they doing? How are they storing that information? Are they caching it on the app itself? People were not taking a lot of steps in order to kind of protect because they were, they were securing the API itself but not the app. And I think that's a big thing that you, you have to take into account. And obviously, there are regulations that you have to take into account in terms of like PCI compliance, make sure that everything, the entire path, the app, the server, your backend, you're not storing credit card numbers, you're not uh, storing social security numbers in clear. You're, you're encrypting it in logs, you're making sure you're redacting those things, make sure you're doing all of those that are. The next thing is external APIs. Sorry, if you can go back to this Are one? you suggesting that a bank should then create a bit of their own app store? Because being able to, if someone's consuming the APIs and it's not someone I have control over, I have to now introspect or, or review them. So it's a very good question. There's a very good question. Practices right now, as an industry, as an API industry, we haven't, there are not a lot of best practices around what you need to do around the app. But I think a few of our customers, what they do is, there's everything around an API. But the banks, and that comes to what I'll talk about in the next thing also, external APIs. You need a process in place where you're approving and testing the app. If you look at what just happened last week in China, <laughs> did you hear that uh, Apple, did their apps, like big apps like Spotify, they were, they had been hacked, essentially. And Apple has a very stringent process of approving those apps, but still they had been hacked. So there, there has to be a process in place, uh, and, and we'll talk about it. I mean, one of our bank, what it does is, uh, I'll talk about it in the external APIs. So one of the con conversations that we have with external APIs is, banks often ask us, should I have open APIs, which is public APIs, everyone can come and access that, or should it be private or B2B APIs? And I think that debate 
continues to happen today. Every new bank that we go to, they ask about this question. OK, I'm exposing an API. It's an external API, but should, I, should it be open or should it be private, in the sense only for our partners? And I think for, the, for specifically the banking and fintech, and I might be wrong. I mean, for fintech, it might be not. But for traditional bank, given the products and services that you have, what we have seen is 90% of the use cases are private. APIs, which is you want to expose a service only for a certain set of partners. It's not like you're exposing your customer information or banking information or something to anybody can come in and access it. Your use cases are not there. Those use cases are not there. They might evolve over a period of time. They're not there right now. So 90% of there are what also that means is if they're private or partner or B2B APIs, you can create customer custom contracts and SLAs. So the contracts or the API keys or the licenses underlying your APIs, you can create customized contracts, you can have custom SLAs, and you can give them much better, better services because you don't have millions of developers or partners accessing it. Uh, it's, it's a few select, maybe thousands of partners instead of millions of developers. This thing goes into what you were saying, app provisioning and security. So few of, few of our banks that have launched external APIs, they have a process around first the API key and the developer gets the license and that, that gets approved. And then the app itself, when they develop the app, before the app can go live on the app store, they have another process in place wherein they go and test the app and make sure the app is. So, so there's another step that you have to take into place and that can be automated. We have, like at Akana, we have something called app lifecycle management that kind of clubbed into the API management pro product that approves the app once it goes into production so that you can automate the app thing. So, so I, I, and I think that's a very important process. And, and another use case is API federation, which is you take multiple APIs and you might have other partner APIs that you have. You, you might have a payment API that you don't have as a bank, but you are using it from Stripe or some other vendor. But you want to expose it to your external audience as a single aggregated API. So you federate multiple APIs from other partners, but expose them as one single API to your customers or your API developers. Then finally, the last, last steps. Once you have done all of this, unlock data, share APIs, make them secure, once you have internal APIs, you start sharing external. The next step is a lot of banks already have a lot of monolith apps, whether it's mainframe or traditional applications that you have created. But those traditional applications, if you see, there are a lot of challenges with them. The reason why most banks are slow, uh, there are a lot of reasons behind it. But one of the things is these are large monolithic apps. It takes a lot of time to change them. They're they're non-scalable in the sense that you have to lock hardware with them. You can lock a lot of hardware, but it's hard to manage. Revision control is difficult. Build processes are huge. They run into months. And it's slow to deploy. It's very complex to deploy and manage. So that's the complexity that comes with monolith apps. If you look at microservices, that's a new concept that's coming up. Microservices are essentially very, very small. They can be deployed on containers. They're ephemeral in nature in the sense that you can bring up a container on demand. It comes up almost in instantaneously, uses very little resource. They're extremely scalable. Scalable not only in your private data center, but on the cloud. There are a lot of services that help you bring up containers and microservices wherever you want. Very, very easy to learn. Your developers can code in any specific language. They're not tied to any specific. So, so, so the whole microservices concept allows you to build applications with a lot of speed. They scale uh, almost uh, linearly, uh, very easy to develop, very easy to deploy. So what does it take to build a microservice, and why should banks care? The benefits are obviously improve agility. Uh, you have better reliability and elasticity. There, those services are running into multiple containers. They can be brought up anywhere in the cloud or private data center. Global scalability. But the challenges, again, remain is microservices is a very, very different architecture. You have to build a culture not only around learning microservices, but continuous development, continuous integration. You have to build the agile development. All that culture needs to be built up. Uh, it's greenfield versus re-architecting, which is don't try to break up your existing monolith applications and create a microservices. If you are coming up with new applications, 
use them for microservices or use the microservices architecture over there. Don't try to break up your existing because it's uh, use. So here is kind of a step, a couple of steps for creating or architecting and applications. So take your existing monolith applications or applications that you have, expose them as APIs. Traditionally, I mean, 40 plus APIs or whatever, you can take a, break up a monolith application into 40 plus APIs, and then expose them wherever you want to for your digital and multi-channel. The second step would be to break your monolith applications into maybe five or 10 applications. So break, either make the data silos, break up the data silos or application silos, subsegment your applications, expose them as APIs, and then share. And then finally, in the long term, in the ideal state of the world, everything becomes a microservice. And I think this is no longer a hype. I think the, the reality behind microservices is there. It's still very, very early. People talk about microservices washing and things like that, but I think the reality is there. You need to start learning it, start looking at it. I, I think just like SOAP was legacy and it's now been replaced by APIs, I think in the future microservices are going to be very, very important in this industry. So that kind of brings me to the end, which is make sure when you're creating a digital bank, create a digital ecosystem with APIs. Make sure you integrate all these different APIs and create a customer-centric view. Customer centricity is very, very important when you secure your digital interaction, which is make sure your APIs are secure. And not only the APIs, the consuming apps themselves are secure because you need to make sure what they're doing with the data. And start experimenting, experimenting with hybrid infrastructure, microservices-based infrastructure. And I say experimenting because it's still early in the stage. It's not mature enough. But you need to start looking at it. So that's all I had. Uh, I had a couple of more slides about Akana. Uh, we are obviously an API management platform. We have the entire thing around analytics, developer engagement, API gateway, uh, lifecycle management, like I talked about. With this, I think I've run out of time. Okay. Thank you.